Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on authoritarianism and misinformation in Eastern Europe. My name is Jose Casanova, and I'm a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs that co-sponsors this event together with the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting. Uh, these events, a series of events, uh, are generously founded by the Luce Foundation. Uh, we have today two prominent speakers. Uh, part of this project is to bring together uh, journalists and scholars to help us understand better the contemporary developments in the relation between religion, authoritarianism, populism, misinformation, and this is part of the event today, focusing on Eastern Europe. Uh, we are having two speakers. Uh, first, Simon Ostrowski, who is a PBS News Hour special correspondent and an award winning freelance news and documentary producer. He also works frequently with the Pulitzer Center to bring underreported stories to American audiences. He, his work primarily focuses on popular politics and uprisings in Russia and the former Soviet Union. Our other speaker today is Professor Marlene Laruel, who is research professor of international affairs at the George Washington University's Elliott School of National Affairs, as well as director of the university's, university's Central Asia Program and director of its Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. He has published prominently uh, two of his most uh, recent books are Understanding Russia, The Challenges of Transformation, 2018, and more recently, is Russia fascist, unraveling propaganda East and West. After their presentation, uh, my colleague and senior fellow at the Berkeley Center and prominent scholar of Islam, religion and politics, uh, will uh, begin the conversation with them and then we'll open the conversation to the audience. This uh, webinar is being recorded. Uh, the uh, video caption will be available on the uh, website of the Berkeley Center uh, shortly in a few days. Those of you who have registered for the webinar will receive a link to the, uh, um, to the YouTube. Uh, uh, those of you who like to post questions, please use the question and answer symbol at the bottom of the screen. We'll try to leave at least the last 15 minutes for uh, 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 questions and comments from all of you. So without further ado, please, Simon, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, event. I really appreciate the opportunity from the Berkeley Center as well as the Pulitzer Center, um, the latter of which I work with frequently, uh, as Jose said, on bringing underreported stories to American audiences, primarily on the PBS uh, NewsHour program, um, which is the channel that I work for the most with Pulitzer. Um, Pulitzer Center uh, very generously sent me to Eastern Europe, uh, specifically Lithuania and Poland uh, last summer uh, to look at some of the issues surrounding the rise of authoritarianism in the region. And it's all to do with uh, what's been happening in Belarus, which was a country which I was not able to visit, unfortunately, during this last trip, but, but what is a country that I went to during the uprising in 2020 over the summer and autumn of that year, also um, with the help of the Pulitzer Center. And the interesting thing that I found looking back at what's happened over the last several months, over the last half a year or so, is the way that the migration crisis um, has really transformed since I was there over the summer when it was primarily a uh, homegrown migration crisis in Belarus, uh, whose uh, the people involved 
um, were primarily dissidents from Belarus itself who were fleeing the uh, increasingly authoritarian regime because uh, ever since the elections of 2020 uh, and the ensuing protests, we've seen thousands of people try to flee the country in ways that are really reminiscent of things that we've seen happen um, decades ago during the Cold War when people were trying to flee um, across the Iron Curtain into Western Europe. Um, in Lithuania, I met one man who actually flew across the border uh, in a paraglider device that he purchased for himself a couple of years before, uh, simply as part of his parachute hobby. I don't know if uh, any of you have actually seen what these things are like, but it's essentially a chair with a propeller attached to it and a parachute on the top. And you sort of do a running start and, uh, and pick yourself up off into the air. And it can actually go pretty reasonable distances. Um, this man whose only crime was to post on social media that he was angry about the police forces actions against protesters during the uprising uh, was first charged with insulting police and threatened with a four to five year prison sentence and was told that if he confessed on camera, then he would be released and that would be the end of it. And what happened instead uh, was that this individual uh, had the video broadcast on national television, was essentially shamed in front of the entire country, which is something that we've seen repeated over and over with people who've been arrested in Belarus for participating um, in various unsanctioned activities and was then had, had another charge thrown at him of actually uh, attacking a police officer um, and basically faced a nine month, a nine year sentence. And at that point, he decided that he just needed to get out of the country. So we were focusing on people like that. Um, and over the last several months, if those of you who have been following what's been going on uh, on the Belarus Polish border, you've seen that there have now been thousands of asylum seekers and migrants, primarily from the Middle East, who are being ferried into Belarus at the behest of the Belarusian government and the Lukashenko regime. And this has sort of given a totally different flavor to the migration crisis, because if you saw the EU countries that border Belarus uh, being relatively supportive of the asylum seekers who were leaving Belarus at the early stages of the crisis when it was uh, political dissidents from Belarus trying to get out. Now you saw you see this 180 degree turn in policy um, of the border being fortified, closed, troops being sent there in order to try to prevent uh, people from countries like uh, Iraq and Afghanistan getting across. And this phenomenon has actually fed into um, the right-wing populist government's policies uh, in Poland, the Law and Justice Party, which has now been able to use this crisis as a way of showing once again um, that it is the only uh, viable political um, power in Poland which is able to defend Polish citizens uh, against what they view as an encroachment of uh, uh, outsiders, Muslims, and, and uh, that they are the only power that's able to protect uh, Polish people from you know, this erosion of what they see as Christian and family values. Um, so you see like the authoritarian governments of Belarus and the authoritarian leaning ruling party of Poland feeding off of each other. And in a way, although it's a crisis, somehow helping each other out. Um, my focus in Poland at the time when I was visiting um, was to shine a light on the Law and Justice Party's policy of holding up the uh, LGBT community as the enemy of the moment that they could rally their base around. So the story focused on um, these so-called anti-LGBT ideology declarations that have been enacted by about 30% of the municipalities uh, that you have in Poland. And the municipalities in Poland are, Poland are kind of like counties. So basically a third of the country uh, enacted these really strongly worded declarations that don't have the force of law, but essentially tell 
members of the communities that they're enacted in that the local government is in opposition to the LGBT community and they want to eradicate LGBT ideology from the schools uh, and from political discourse. And you can imagine how this makes people who are members of that community living there feel, um, feel living in those places, feel unsafe living in those places. Uh, because although it's not a ban on being gay, what it is, is it's a, essentially a signal that the government is sen sending that you are unwelcome. Uh, and one of the interesting things that I found out researching this story later on is that there's a really strong parallel to how this kind of legislation, these kinds of declarations get approved in local legislatures uh, to the United States. A few, a few years ago, when I was still working at Vice News, we were reporting on legislation that was authored by a think tank in Mississippi called the uh, American Family Association. Essentially what think tanks like this do is they draft laws and uh, they then distribute them to friendly lawmakers around the country and local legislatures. And then they hope that those uh, local legislators are able to enact them on a, on a state or a local level. Um, the story at the time that I was looking at were the sort of religious freedom um, laws that the right was trying to get passed everywhere in reaction to that famous story of a bakery uh, refusing to bake a wedding cake for a gay couple. Something very similar is happening in Poland. There, they have a think tank called Ordo Juris, which translates from Latin as order of law and or a rule of law. And uh, uh, this think tank drafted the sort of initial texts for these uh, anti-LGBT declarations, uh, delivered them to as many municipalities as they possibly could, and resulted in sort of a third of the country accepting them. I was speaking to the uh, ombudsman, uh, the former ombudsman of Poland about this issue. And the way he explained it to me is that when law and justice came to power, Originally, you know, they came to power on, on a platform of fighting against the um, original migrant crisis that we saw back in 2015 and 2016. And at that time, that was what he described as the political coin that they could use to rally their base. By the summer of last year, it had shifted to attacks on the LGBT community. And now it's come back around full circle and with the new migration crisis, um, we're seeing the new political coin that they're using to rally their base is the old one, the, the uh, primarily Muslim migrants coming from the Middle East who have been brought in um, via Belarus. So I think now, especially with discussions around what the Supreme Court in the United States is going to do with um, Roe versus Wade and abortion, we can look back at Poland uh, as a country that's already gone through something like that a couple of years ago, where law and justice managed to push through legislation, essentially almost totally banning abortion in that country, resulting in months and months and months of protest uh, and, and chaos in that country. And I think it's maybe a little bit of a uh, foreshadowing of what we're possibly going to see here. Um, the, the other thing that I'm looking at, which is part of another project uh, that I'm doing as a fellow for uh, the Knight Wallace Fellowship of the University of Michigan, is looking at strategies that various places have taken up as uh, effective counters to disinformation. I'm traveling to Estonia in a week uh, to investigate how their efforts have fared against Russian disinformation. Estonia in 2007 experienced uh, a riot which was inspired uh, by Russian disinformation and propaganda rallying the local Russian speaking population uh, around the issue of the removal of a World War II era monument in the center of uh, Tallinn. And for Estonia, a country where literally nothing hardly ever happens, this, this turned uh, politics up on its head and sowed chaos essentially there for uh, several weeks. It was also combined with a uh, cyber attack on the country's financial and banking system. And this was a real wake up call to Estonians that they potentially have a problem in the form of their Russian speaking minority, which feels disillusioned 
uh, feels like it's not a, a core part of Estonian society and therefore susceptible to outside influence that plays on their um, grievances. And understandably for years after Estonia gained independence from the Soviet Union, um, Estonia wanted to promote its own language, its own language and its own culture and get rid of symbols of the Soviet colonial past. Um, this made their Russian speaking population feel alienated and Estonians were pretty much fine with that state of affairs until the riot, uh, riots happened in 2007. Uh, the annexation of Crimea, of course, was another wake up call for them that Russia potentially had uh, plans in mind for, its, for the border countries that had large Russian speaking minorities. And so what they did in response to that uh, was very interesting. They decided um, that the best way to deal with this information isn't necessarily to sort of counter it at its source or block it on the internet, um, but it's to take the communities that are susceptible to this disinformation and to make them feel more a part of the society that they're in, that they have more of a stake in that society. So they put out job trainings programs, they put out language training programs, they made it easier for Russian speaking Estonians to gain uh, Estonian citizenship. Um, they even did cultural um, exchanges sort of between Russian speaking areas of the country and Estonian speaking areas of the country, brought interesting um, lecture series to the Russian speaking areas of the country. They moved a, uh, a branch of the biggest university in the country to Narva, which is on the border with Russia. And they opened a native uh, Russian language television station, a public broadcaster that broadcasts to uh, uh, Russians in their own language, which would have been anathema to the ideology um, of the Estonian government before these events took place, because they were trying to promote the Estonian language, not the Russian language. And they found that over the years um, that uh, Estonians trust uh, in state institutions and Estonian Russian language media has outpaced their trust in uh, Russian language media from Russia itself. So that can be chopped up as a success. But the problem that I want to look at more closely is how successful has this actually been? Because the other thing that we've noticed over the course, course of the pandemic is that Russian speakers uh, who, uh, Russian speakers in Estonia are much less likely to want to get vaccinated than the general population. And uh, people there believe that that has to do with the fact that uh, Russian speakers are still getting some of their information from Russia and early on in the pandemic, um, the Russian government uh, went all out, pulled out the stops, um, trying to make the Pfizer vaccine, which is the one that's uh, most widely available in Estonia, look bad in comparison to the Sputnik vaccine that was being made available in Russia. So you had this paradoxical situation where you had Russian uh, speaking Estonians asking for Sputnik um, in Estonia and not getting vaccinated because it wasn't available there. It's not available anywhere in the European Union. And so I think this all goes to show that while the Estonian efforts have been able to bridge some of the divides, um, they haven't been able to completely wean Russian speakers in Estonia off of media um, from Russia. And it had this uh, sort of uh, counterintuitive negative effect um, uh, on the Russian speakers there. Um, making them much less pr uh, protected uh, during the pandemic. Thank you, Simon. We'll have time to come back to the conversation. Uh, I want to remind the audience that you have the chance already to begin writing as, 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 as the program goes, your questions at the question and answer symbol at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please, uh, Marlene. Thank you so much for the invitation and I will kind of take where, where Simon stopped to continue the discussion on the two notions that we have in our title, authoritarianism and, and, and misinformation. And, and the way I look at the rise of authoritarianism in Central and Eastern Europe is in fact not by looking specifically at the changes of practice of power by those who are uh, uh, leading these countries, but by making the discussion broader and looking at what I 
call illiberalism in the sense of a backlash against political liberalism, economic liberalism, and cultural liberalism. And each time, the backlash, depending on the country, can be organized differently, more political, more economic, more cultural backlash, depending what is the liberalism that is the, the most attacked. And I use that notion of illiberalism more than the one of authoritarianism because it allows us to look at the kind of a multi-layered uh, level of action. It's not only a good political leadership. It's not only a good political party and the resistance or the resilience of institution. It's about ideological entrepreneur. It's about the change in civil society and the rise of an illiberal civil society. It's about a grassroots mindset that is evolving and that is expressing grievances against some form of, of liberalism. And so when we look at the Central Europe, Central European, Eastern European landscape, of course, Russia has been the kind of historic leader of this backlash against liberalism in the early uh, 2000. But I don't think we should be looking for a kind of original sinner because it's a global trend that and each time the domestic context uh, uh, matter a lot. And clearly for Central Europe, it's now Hungary and Poland that are leading in this kind of uh, illiberal trend, even if here also I think there are huge differences between Poland and, and uh, Hungary on the way the, the, the resistance or the resilience of the population is uh, organizing itself. So I say that domestic context matter a lot, but you also have transnational connection that are growing and that I think should be taken into consideration. You have networks originally from the US, now a very strong network coming from Russia that are trying to kind of create the connection between this illiberal movement. And I would add now Hungary. I think for years we were used to see Putin's Russia leading the trend. I think now really Orban has been growing in trying to take the lead of at least at the European level of creating this transnational of uh, uh, illiberal leaders. He has also been growing connection with the US. And you may know that the, the CPAC convention, this big US conservative convention uh, uh, that is mostly now around a uh, follower of Trump will be organized in Budapest in a few months. So there you will have probably a huge networking, <laughs> huge networking activities happening in, the, in Budapest. So what we see, I think, in the region globally, and then I'm looking mostly at, at uh, more Central Europe than, than the, the Russia case, it's, a, it's, it's three level or three layers of, of, of changes. One, it's this kind of attack against institution and civil society. So it's about, I would say, more autocratization than authoritarianism. It's about democratic decay or the difficulties of democratic institution to resist the attacks that they are currently facing. So that's the kind of the political institutional level. Then you have a revival of conservative thinking and feelings and expression that you can notice all over uh, uh, the region that include or instrumentalize religious identity understood both as a kind of cultural Christianism that is not related to practicing religion or not. It's more about kind of expressing a national identity or some cultural feature through a reference to religion. And it's also, especially for the case of Poland and Russia, the growing role of the church in lobbying state authorities and trying to change legislation. So I see that kind of revival of conservatism as the kind of second layer. And then there is a third one that is usually defined by the terminology of populism, a kind of rebellious aspect, something that looks more grassroots, or but that has also kind of its own entrepreneur, that is uh, uh, very often coming from culturally from the far right uh, uh, subculture that want to fight against the establish what they define as the establishment of the system, and that I think it's important to bring this kind of rebellious aspect in the discussion to dissociate that from classic conservatism. While classic conservatism can work very well in a democratic system think about, I don't know, the German Christian Democrats. What you have with this kind of illiberal movement, it's a narrative that indeed has, has values uh, uh, in, for example, believing in traditional uh, hierarchy, the traditional family. So it has roots in conservatism, but it has this rebellious and ready to fight aspect that is coming from far right culture. And that's this merging that we are uh, uh, noticing uh, um, 
in the region. And so for me, that's this liberalism. It's both what is happening at the political level, this revival of conservatism, and this kind of rebellious aspect of people unsatisfied and, and ready to, to go against uh, uh, the democratic system, sometimes with violent means. And that's where the misinformation arrive in, in the discussion. And I think that's a quite complex term. And you know the differences between misinformation, disinformation. What we have in the US context that I think is a, is a nice formulation is this notion of partisan bias, that you are so much the, the, the polarization around political and philosophical views on societal issues is becoming so strong, right? So this kind of importation of US cultural war into a European context, that the level of partisan bias is so important that you have a rise of misinformation that can shift to disinformation once it gets deployed and instrumentalized by political actor. And so this kind of US import of cultural war that we see in Europe, or maybe European import of US cultural war, it's uh, uh, the, the usual kind of attempt to reduce women rights, all the discussion about abortion, also about domestic violence. And as you may know, several Central European countries have been uh, uh, leaving the Istanbul Convention on, on domestic, the criminalization of domestic violence. It's of course the weaponization of LGBT issues are the kind of the flagship flagship of the supposed decadent and morally corrupt uh, uh, West. And of course, the boundaries between misinformation fed by partisan bias and kind of philosophical worldview and intentional disinformation is very blurry and very fluid. And I think you have both in Central Europe and, and the Eurasian, the, the Central Europe and Eastern uh, region. Always also remember that this information, it's not only about ideological entrepreneur, it's also a business model that bring money. A lot of these information websites are not only done for ideological purpose, they are just a business model to make money. And if you think about the, for example, the rise of troll factories, well, we all know the, the St. Petersburg troll factory of Prigozhin and his role in the 2016 uh, uh, Russian interference in US election, but the Montenegro troll factory is mostly done, was mostly done for financial purposes, not really for ideological one. So I think here you have interesting case of kind of neoliberal practices of, of selling fake information as being part of this media ecosystem that we have in Central Eastern Europe, and in fact, everywhere that works also for the US, where it's very difficult to dissociate what is organized by state actor, by local actor, who is reverberating, who is that really about ideology, about money, is that just about algorithm and bots reproducing in a kind of automatic manner the, the narrative that are the most uh, viral, viral. And I think that's where it makes the, the discussion for us so, so kind of uh, uh, difficult. In Russia, you really have an overlap between what is the state policy, the, the rise of disinformation practices and the role of uh, religion, if you want to bring it into the, the discussion. For the Putin's regime, disinformation, it's a way to do hybrid warfare. It's cheap and it allows plausible deniability. And the, the Russian political establishment has a very clear vision of their the fact that Russia is a poor great power. And when you are poor, but you still have ambition to be a great power, you need to be smart and to spend the money you have, the little money you have in a smart way. If you cannot compete economically or militarily with the US, then you can compete in terms of producing narratives because producing narrative costs almost nothing. And that's something where Russia has been able really to develop some, some kind of competencies but also because in Russia, you have a strong tradition of conspiracy theories, and you have a largely shared vision uh, that we are in a post-truth world. And that's something that is genuinely share, shared by, by many people in Russia. So if you look at the, the Russian media production for abroad, you really have what is really fascinating is the eclecticism of narrative. You have narrative for the far right, narrative for the far left, narrative for Christian Europe, narrative for the Islamic world narrative against migrants for European audience, narrative against European colonialism for African audience. So it's really this capacity of demultiplying narratives for different audience and really speaking to niches that I think has explained the kind of the rise of, of Russia as the kind of big producer of misinformation slash disinformation. Uh, 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 campaign and the role of religion to very briefly to 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 finish on that it's to be 
deployed in an instrumental manner because once you deploy religion, you anchor political issue into a philosophical worldview that is in fact limited the ability to compromise and to find a political consensus because you feel it's kind of attacking things that are core to your own uh, 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 identity. And I think that's why also Central and Eastern Europe have been so strong in this uh, 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 aspect because we have this revival of what we could call identitarian Christianism in the sense of a cultural national identification, the will to reconnect with the national past, we think that are kind of imagine a, a tradition against uh, uh, the changes that the region has been facing since uh, the, the, the end of the, the, the communist regime. And also because the public sphere has been more and more invaded or occupied by religious institution with more or less the agreement of the state. And here, as I was saying, I think Poland and, and uh, Russia are really fascinating parallel, but still different cases where both the Catholic Church and the Russian Orthodox Church has been really trying to lobby state authorities and state institution in trying to push for their own agenda, and especially in changing legislation related to, to societal issues, even if I think there are big differences. We always tend to see Russia as the kind of the conservative power of the moment. If you look at surveys, the Polish society is much more conservative than the Russian societies in terms of abortion or divorce, for example. Where they really meet in, in high conservatism, it's against the, the, the LGBT issues, and that's what uh, Simon was, was discussing uh, uh, very uh, um, interestingly. Um, I, I don't think I will have time to discuss more about the role of the Orthodox Church, but I'm happy to, to bring that in the discussion. And just to conclude and to follow a kind of second what Simon said, for the case of Russia, I think Russia should really be seen as an echo chamber of our own weaknesses. Therefore, it means that the way to fight and to kind of counter disinformation or misinformation coming from, from Russia, it's by reinforcing our own communities, our own values, and trying to speak to those who are disenfranchised. I don't think that any kind of, you know, strategies of, of really countering media narratives from Russia by producing ourselves another narrative is solving the issue. The issue is to make people inoculated against uh, disinformation. And to inoculate, you need to allow people to disentangle what means, what are their core values and that are meaningful for them, and what are the elements where the, the logical approach is kind of cheating, cheating them. And so, Globally, I think also that when we are discussing this rise of authoritarianism in, in, in Central um, uh, Europe, you don't really fight the success, for example, of Orban by just hoping to change the political institution. And we can see now how it's difficult for the European Union to find a way institutionally to punish Hungary and Poland without taking the risk of aggravating the crisis and having potentially them asking to leave the, the European Union. The only way you can try to act is by addressing the local grievance that people have been expressing and trying to disentangle the popular support that has been given to these illiberal leaders and illiberal strategies. And if you can disentangle that, then these leaders will lose progressively their, their, their popular support. And that's where you can hope to bring back part of the constituencies into a more classic uh, um, uh, a liberal democratic framework where institution can function in a, in a smoother way and allow for a plurality of, of opinion. I will stop here. I think I'm going out, uh, running out of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marlene. Uh, now, Jocelyn is going to bring the begin the conversation adding reflections and comments to the two presentations before we open the floor to the audience. So, Jocelyn. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Simon and, and Marlene. Uh, I would like to locate or relocate this flash or zoom on, uh, on Russia and uh, Belarusi on, uh, in the global trend of actually um, not opposing any more democracy to authoritarianism. I think we have passed, unfortunately, this kind of neat uh, demarcation in the sense that all studies show a slow, but I, 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 some would say irreversible crumbling of um, equality, 
of mobility in even the long-standing democracies. Uh, and you can look at the trends in Western Europe. America is uh, also a striking example of that. There is greater and greater segmentation, bifurcation of different segments of societies. And this means that people do not trust democracy anymore. There is less and less um, uh, confidence in the capacity of institutions and democratic institutions in particular to redistribute. And I think this is a trend that should not be put on the side in the sense that the same challenges are happening everywhere. And uh, from Europe to the US to Belarus to Muslim countries that I, uh, I know the most. Um, so having said that, it's very difficult to say there is democracy and non-democracy. That's why a lot of uh, options now to look at what people call hybrid system. And I think Russia is an hybrid system uh, in, in this regard. I cannot say that uh, Russia is, fits the model of authoritarianism as we learn it in the book. <laughs> so uh, because the use of some kind of mechanism of um, uh, appeal to people, elections, votes, kind of consultation, lots of things going on, separation of power, even if it's limited. So once you have said that, um, my, my interest is not only in authoritarianism trend or, de on, or de democratization trend, it's also in what's the role of religion in that. Um, and again, it is not a yes or no answer. It is not religion is on one side or, or the other, to uh, use the term of the late step, and religion is multivocal. And uh, so if we break down what, what's happening, for example, in the um, lack or, or loss of democratization in political institutions, we know, and again, here I took under the control of Jose, we know that for a long, long time, the Catholic Church has been a, a huge support of authoritarian military regime in Latin America. Uh, even before we talk about the incompatibility between Islam and democracy, we're talking, at, <laughs> I was not maybe over there, but Jose knows this even better than me, that we're talking about the incompatibility between democracy and Catholicism. So, there is a sort of connivence here of institutions that we should never completely uh, disregard. And I would say this also explains the fact that sometimes it's counterproductive to look at the religiosity of people to understand the proclivity of some religion with uh, authoritarian institution. And that's the case of, of uh, uh, of, of Trump, for example. People don't care. The people who vote for Trump don't care if uh, he is a good, pious uh, person. They care because they see him as a vehicle, actually a tool of God, toward achieving a certain goal. So the question, if you measure the, the religiosity of people, you're not going to get that. If you look at the way that some religious institution will mobilize their uh, followers, will mobilize their resource to make this agenda anti-abortion, anti-LGBT, part of a political mainstream discussion, it is much more interesting uh, uh, in this regard. And in, indeed, the level of religiosity of people doesn't matter. And even in Russia, uh, Marlene, people are, are nominally Russian, uh, but th what counts is the push of the of the Russian Orthodox Church, not only to have a cultural discourse on orthodoxy, but to have a proactive uh, legislation or implementing legislation or policy orientation. And I think this is something we are not paying attention enough. We are victim of what I call the European, Western European syndrome, where people are calling civil Christian civilizationism, as one of my colleagues said, but they cannot care less. And those churches in Europe are against this use of religion. So I'm not saying that the connivence is always there. What is striking in Europe is that if you look at the position of the Catholic Church against populist movements today, they are all 
all the um, establishment, Catholic establishment or other kind of religious establishment are fighting against the use of Christianity as, as a tool for uh, strengthening authoritarianism or exclusion of immigrants or religious minorities and so on. So again, how does this work? When and how religion becomes significant at this political institution uh, level is, um, is, is a question that, that goes beyond, I would say, the, the two areas of the region uh, to which we are uh, interested today. The second level, is the, the level of societal influence of religion. And, and here it's, it is not about religious groups doing good deeds like welfare. It's about societal in the sense that some religious communities today everywhere have the um, ambition to redefine the social contract. And here, that's I think where populism comes in. The, the populism is not only calling the unity of all Christian American or all Orthodox Russian or belong or beyond. It is also about saying we as believers have something to say about redefining the social contract in which we live. And most of the time, indeed, it's a conservative agenda and everywhere from uh, Islam to Orthodoxy to Catholicism to different forms of Protestantism, the focus is on women. As I say always, the body of women is a huge site of contestation today about sexual minorities, about an attempt to remoralize the, the public space. Um, and here, that's where I would say the um, level of expectation of the followers count. In Russia, for example, the, the Russian Orthodox Church has not been successful as it has been in Poland for pushing anti-abortion legislation. Why? Because indeed, the, the majority of Russian, even if they identify to Orthodoxy, do not care about prescription, religious prescription in their daily life. And that's where the difference emerged. While in America, you can see that the country, Simon, you mentioned it, is divided on this issue. You are people who would like very much with the help of institution to push a sort of more conservative agenda on abortion, uh, sexual minorities and so on. So, um, and that's also the difference with Western Europe. The people who claim we are Christian, they would be very horrified if tomorrow anti-abortion, anti-LGBT uh, legislation would come up. You know, it's more like uh, indeed a civilizational marker than the, the goal to refound the, the, the social contract. Um, and, and, and that's why, um, for, for this reason, beyond authoritarianism, you have this dimension of populism. Not all authoritarianism are populist. And uh, we can discuss, indeed, uh, that's a huge discussion we can have. We started in the workshop before about uh, Putin being a populist or not. I don't think that Putin is populist, but there are trends among the Russian societies today who are very, uh, keen to push this more moral kind of vision of Russian society. And if you look even at the last constitution or amendment to the constitution voted uh, last year or, or earlier this year, I cannot remember exactly, for the first time you have mention of orthodoxy, you have banning, I think, a definition of the marriage as a, a union between a man and a woman. This is, for me, what I call the religious pop. And this reminds me the question, the, the status of Islam in lots, lots of Muslim countries. Um, so, Simon, I'm not sure that Belarus fits into all this, <laughs> this uh, um, rearrangement at the uh, institutional level or at the social level and the role of religion uh, in it. For sure, there is weaponization of immigration, of vaccine, I finish, of um, and convergence with more conservative agenda. But again, um, 
how much of the religion can be broken down into institution, some ideas that are appealing not only to religious actors, but also to political ones. And, and, um, and, and the role of intermediary groups between the state and, and religious communities. And I stop here. Thank you, Jocelyn, for these very challenging comments. I don't think we'll have the time to go uh, deeply into them. I want first to open the floor for some of the questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, there is a question, two questions from, uh, uh, let's say, the same person. Let me, let me uh, read them because they are both directed at Marlene. One is specific by Aaron Morton Wilson. One is specifically how fascist is Russia, which of course is a book you've written about, so you, you can really answer the question. I mean, are those fascist moments, fascist elements, or are we talking of really, really uh, 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 a, a clear long-term target like the Jews in Germany? Has that changed? So, so again, question about fascism. How, how close is this to fascism and how, how valid is the characterization? And then uh, he basically raises a different question, but it's related to your own point. Uh, would you say the local narrative constructed by regimes like Russia is closer to what the political establishment there actually believe? So if they believe in it, of course, it's not disinformation, right? It's propaganda of the regime about itself. So please, uh, these two related questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, on the first question, very briefly, because it's not the, the, the purpose of the discussion uh, today. No, in the book, I try to answer that the, the, the qualification of fascism doesn't work for the Russian regime. We may have some small feature, in, especially in sub subculture inside the regime, the regime's different ecosystem that have some feature of what we would define as fascism. There is a strong militia culture that has a lot of the symbolism, aesthetics, body language, masculinity. A, a cult of violence element that would fit the, the definition of fascism, but the rest of the regime is illiberal and not fascist and is playing in a very careful way with any symbol that would be related to fascism and has been really trying to uh, also suppress or repress the most radical movement. So I think the, the Putin's regime is in this kind of difficult equilibrium of trying to be conservative fighting against liberals without giving too much power to groups that are more conservative, more reactionary, more far right. Sometimes that works, sometimes they seems to be partly bypassed. And I think that's what we see now emerging to go back to our discussion. It's not so much the kind of risk of, of kind of brown shirt people in the street. It's the growing role of the Russian Orthodox Church and of some of the most reactionary lobbies in trying to impact the secularity of Russian institution and trying to challenge that and to gain more uh, institutional and policy making power. I think that's where the real kind of political risk is there. On the second question about political belief of the elites, well, we have good studies about uh, good surveys done about the, the Russian elites. They are much more nuanced than what the regime would like to say. They are very often, the, the disillusion, disillusion with the West is a real and genuine one this feeling that Russia is not understood, that what Russia wants to get from the West is not giving to us, that I think is genuinely uh, shared. Also that the West is losing itself and its own identity. It's also largely shared and genuine. All the rest is largely uh, an instrumental construction done uh, by the goal, uh, by, by the regime just for its own uh, uh, legitimacy. If I can very, very briefly on what Justin said, because it's really important, um, um, elements. I, I totally agree. The only moment where I would be uh, slightly nuancing that is that if you look at the progressive rehabilitation of the church in the collapse of the Soviet Union, in the 90s, the church was rehabilitated by the public opinion as a symbol of the nation and the culture of Russia, the continuity of Russia beyond the Soviet parenthesis before gaining any institutional power. So there was, I think, this kind of the church and the symbol of the Russian nation getting revived after communism, that was the first element. And then the institutional aspect arrived. And what we see now, and we have a survey that was just done a few months ago, 
is that the society is getting ultra polarized. So it's kind of looking US style. I mean, not with the same political culture, where really you can identify almost like 45% in favor of the church getting more power, 45% against. 45% for less abortion rights, 45% for more. So except on anti-homosexuality where there it's, it's very high, the rest seems very, very clearly divided and we begin being able to identify constituencies. The mm. same, not at the same level as, is, as in the US, but we begin being able to say, okay, the cons there is conservative constituencies, we can identify regions, social classes, you know, all the kind of demographics aspect to say that progressively we can see this solidification of there is conservative constituencies and there are liberal constituencies in the Russian society, which we didn't have before. So, mm. so it's all a, a work in progress, but I think the church reached a plateau. Now it has been fighting so much again, the secularity of state institution, trying to entry uh, the school system to be so more influential on everything related to privacy. Now it's backlashing. So now the part of the society that doesn't want more of the church is kind of reacting and the two groups are getting more and more polarized against each other. And that is a very recent uh, phenomenon. Let me just stop here. Uh, let me raise a few questions related. I will not follow them, but they all have to do with immigration and refugees and the, and the Belarus Poland border. On the one hand, uh, what can Poland do to somehow uh, uh, include the refugees and contribution to global security. On the other hand, the fact that actually the immigration crisis now has helped Poland to be integrated more in the European Union. The European Union is actually now supporting Poland in its very, very fortress uh, uh, relationship with vis-a-vis uh, -vis refugees. So uh, uh, another question about how much uh, the, the populism uh, um, in Hungary and Poland is due to uh, the policies of the European Union. Uh, there are several questions along these lines. So, uh, Simon, the relation of immigration, European Union, uh, populism, uh, uh, let's say, in uh, uh, the regimes in their Eastern Europe. So I'm no expert on internal EU politics, but um, I will say that the Law and Justice Party in Poland is opposed to any type of migration from um, Muslim countries. And so that they've been very active in doing everything that they possibly can to prevent the migrants uh, on the border from coming across the border uh, into Poland, um, doing everything from sending text messages to all foreign telephone numbers in the area, telling people that they have been tricked um, uh, to come to Belarus and to follow a route that isn't actually open. Um, they've sent lots of uh, troops to the border region. They've put up new fencing at the border region. And there have been some really, really tense standoffs that have involved uh, the Polish um, security services and the uh, Belarusian border guards with the migrants uh, sort of left in between in the no man's land. And I think what was interesting was not that the European Union sent reinforcements, but the country that most recently left the European Union, uh, the United Kingdom, I think, sent about 100 uh, soldiers uh, to help reinforce the uh, Poland's presence at the border there in order to uh, try to prevent the migrants from coming across. So it's, 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 it's kind of odd to me, maybe somebody else on this panel can better explain why the, why the country that left the European Union seems to be the one that's most actively engaged in defending its borders uh, uh, along, uh, along Belarus. Um, but, you know, like I was saying before, I, I think this situation does play into the hands of law and justice because it, it's, it, it helps uh, law and justice show its constituency, um, it playing at its own strengths, because this is what they have been rallying around from the very beginning, which is um, the uh, posing as the saviors of uh, Western civilization and retaining the Christian character uh, of Poland. So I think they've been very happy to demonstrate their ability um, to prevent these migrants from coming through. And they've obviously been shirking their responsibilities in terms of the international agreements they have signed um, where, they need, where they're supposed to be giving each asylum seeker a proper he hearing and deciding whether they qualify uh, on asylum grounds to come into the European Union or not. 
there is a question, a uh, general question by Marjorie manderstam balser about do we see counter trends within religious groups, institutions, let's say in Russia, once upon a time, the Orthodox Church had also a liberal wing that came out of the Soviet, of the Soviet Union period. Uh, is there some sense that there are still followers of the late father Alexander Men? Uh, we, we remember the signing of the letter by priest, uh, basically protecting the, 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 those who had been uh, basically abused by the police and so on. Uh, the same thing, let's say in Eastern Europe, obviously Poland once upon a time uh, had a very broad uh, liberal Catholic movement in, so within solidarity. We had a lot of Catholic parties that were on, on the uh, left center of the regime at the beginning. Is there anything left of liberal Catholicism in Poland? Or basically, are we talking of a church which is fully, fully allied with, with the uh, Law and Justice Party? Having, there is a general question also by Julia Ellings about church and state relations. But there's a difference between Orthodox countries having more uh, uh, fusion between church and state versus, let's say, Catholic countries. So any, anything you may want to say about church and state relations and the, and the fact that there are still counter liberal uh, trends from within the, uh, the, the, the religious traditions or religious groups within those, those countries. So Marlene and then Simon, please. Yeah, I can ask, add very briefly for what I know for, for the Russian case, there are still some liberal parishes inside the Russian Orthodox Church. They are a large minority, small, small minority. They are usually around Moscow and St. Petersburg, so they exist. They can function, but they don't have any room in the hierarchy of the Moscow Patriarchate that has been really entirely taken under control by the either the mainstream conservative or the more kind of reactionary group. So they are allowed to exist at the local level, but they don't have any influence anymore. And given the general political context in Russia, clearly they, they, they won't have. But I think it's a missed opportunity. And globally, it's a missed opportunity all over the region to be able to have kind of more a, 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 a liberal constituency that could have some uh, a religious feeling and not only have a kind of a secular or anti-religious liberalism, that's probably a missed opportunity. But unfortunately, in the current context, at least for Russia, it's really, it's, it's, they have zero influence. Uh, Simon and Poland particularly, or Hungary. Please unmute yourself, Simon. What I noticed when I was reporting um, on the LGBT issue uh, in Poland um, was that the Catholic Church was very monolithic in its uh, resistance to the so-called LGBT ideology seeping through. And what the Catholic Church and the uh, ruling party there have joined forces in doing is uh, essentially dehumanizing the LGBT community um, by saying that it's not a community and that it's simply an ideology. And, um, and in this way, they are, I think on one hand, protecting themselves from uh, Poland's own anti-discrimination uh, laws. And on the other hand, um, trying to insinuate among uh, their followers that um, this is an agenda that's being unfairly pushed on Poland from outside. And that these people who claim to be members of this community um, are not actually a native community to Poland and therefore fighting them shouldn't seem problematic. And we were outside of a church in uh, Pulawi, which is a town about 100, I think 150 kilometers from, from Warsaw, where there was actually a billboard outside the main cathedral in town. It was a sort of notice board where they announce whether there's gonna be a marriage or a funeral. But there was also this poster that had all of the dangerous symbols that um, people should uh, know that their children should avoid. So if they see their children using these symbols, um, then they have something to worry about. And, you know, one of them was a unicorn, which they were alleging was a very dangerous symbol of lesbianism and group sex. And they even had a peace sign there, which they claimed was a satanic symbol. So, you know, they're very... Um, strong in pushing these ideas of these dangerous ideologies seeping into the country to the point of designing their own uh, propaganda uh, posters uh, in order to warn the parishioners about the dangers. Uh, 
Now, I, I think the one other thing I should say is that I think the, the, the church in Poland is much more monolithic than um, religion is uh, in Russia generally, because there are just so many different, uh, not only flavors of Russian orthodoxy uh, in, in Russia, but there is also, of course, massive uh, Muslim and Jewish and Buddhist minorities as well. So uh, Poland is a much more homogenous country, both ethnically and religiously in that sense. Uh, one of the hopeful signs, uh, at least in uh, Hungary, that the way of combating urban populism is by uh, yeah. bringing uh, traditional conservative, true conservative traditional politicians. And we have this conservative major, mayor in, in the small town in Hungary that was able to unify the entire opposition uh, and win uh, the elections against uh, the urban party. And so the idea is to which extent uh, you can bring coalitions of the very many different, so there is no single party is going to be able to go against the Law and Justice Party perhaps, but sort of bring coalitions of very different people that are disaffected with these populist leaders into a, at least electoral coalition. Do you see any possibility of this? In Russia, probably less. In Poland, perhaps less. In Hungary, there are some hopes. Any, any comment on this? Well, very briefly, I think the Russian case is very different politically from what we have in, in the rest of uh, Central Eastern Europe. But you see the, a growing opposition in Russia that is emerging, and it's much more than the Navalny phenomenon. You have a lot at the municipal level. So it's really like local politics, where you see in a lot of cities now independent uh, political actors that are able to get elected against the, the, the official representative of the presidential party, with agenda that are, it's no more about ideas or any kind of political ideology, just about being accountable and more transparent right. and involving citizens right. as stakeholders in local politics. Anti anti-corruption, especially. Yes, mostly right. anti-corruption, but it's really, the, Navalny is a kind of model for a kind of revolutionary opposition. You have a lot of the growing opposition is more a kind of evolutionary, like we will make the change little by little from inside. <laughs> The, the infrastructure and not hope for any kind of a, a revolution, but that is growing. Okay, so we have two more minutes, uh, Simon and Jocelyn, I would like to give you the opportunity to add your comments, your final comments. Uh, no, I don't have any more comments. <laughs> okay, I'm good. what about you, Simon? Any hopeful sign even from the, from the Estonian experience? Beside what you've said, well, I'm I'm not going to draw any conclusions about the Estonian experience until I actually go there and speak to people face to face to find out what the actual figures are. But I still stand by, um, you know, this idea that uh, Marlene uh, and I were mentioning that the best way of dealing with disinformation isn't to fight the disinformation head on and create your own alternative narratives. It's to improve the lives of the people in the places that you live in order to make them less aggrieved and less susceptible um, uh, to grievance-based narratives that can be pushed uh, outside. I do think that that only goes so far because you know so many of the January 6th uh, insurrectionists in the United States were not people who you would say were economically or otherwise disadvantaged. I mean, one of the rioters flew in on a private jet so who knows how effective these kinds of things can be, but I do think that it's more effective um, than trying to you know, block all the content that you disagree with or trying to find a technological solution. So many of us think that all of the solutions are in tech, but actually maybe it wouldn't be so bad to help people out and improve their lives. Well, thank you uh, uh, for this comment. Uh, uh, Simon Ostrowski, Marlene Laruel, Jocelyn Cesari, thank you for thank this interesting conversation. Thank you everybody for, for participating, for, 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 for coming to the, to the webinar. And thank you the Berkeley Center and the Pulitzer Center and the Luz Foundation for bringing us together and making possible this conversation. Thank you all.